We are up to mitzvah number 134. And today we're going to do four different mitzvahs, 134, 135, 136, and 137. Four mitzvahs in a row that relate to the mincha, the meal offering. The first one, 134, is that a Kohen is required to eat the mincha leftovers. So after someone brings a mincha offering, which is like a flower offering, uh, it's called a meal offering, there are different types, we talked about it in the past. The leftovers, whatever is not placed atop the altar that is eaten by the Kohen, that's 134. 135 is that in the event that this is, let's say, a flower mincha, so you would you would bake it, right? The Kohen gets leftover flour, and they would bake it. They make it into pretzels or to cakes or to matzah, but they cannot allow it to become halachically chametz. They cannot allow it to leaven. That is a prohibition. Mitzvah number 135, that a mincha leftover cannot be made into chametz. 136 is the daily mincha offering of the high priest. Every single day, the high priest actually brought two mincha offerings, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. And finally, 137 is the prohibition of consuming from a Kohen's mincha offering, even though there is a mitzvah for a Kohen to consume a mincha offering. If the person who brought the mincha offering is a Kohen themselves, then it is prohibited, and it's a prohibition, mitzvah number 137, for a Kohen to consume from the mincha offering of a fellow Kohen. Of course, these mitzvahs have not been done in nearly 2,000 years, Nevertheless, we study them and we hope to one day be able to witness these mitzvos in the temple. May it be speedily rebuilt. So we're talking about mincha offerings. This is a type of offering. It's not an animal sacrifice. It is called a meal offering. And there are a variety of types of mincha offerings. Uh, they will all have some combination of, of flour and oil and frankincense. And either it's offered plain, just flour as flour, or it's or it's baked, or it's fried in a variety of pans. But regardless, part of it is going to be offered atop the altar, and the leftovers, the parts that are not elevated on the altar, they are eaten by the Kohen. There, of course, is the exception, as we mentioned previously, if the person who brings the mincha offering is a Kohen themselves, then this will be an exception where the Kohen does not eat the leftovers. In fact, the entirety of a Kohen's mincha offering is burned atop the altar, but all other mincha offerings are consumed. The leftovers are consumed by the Kohen. And in every one of these mitzvahs, of course, we get a reason. Not that this is the reason, but this is a framework for us to understand uh, some of the ideas perhaps behind every one of these mitzvahs. And the Sefer Chinuch tells us that when something is consumed by someone honorable, someone prestigious, that gives that offering more honor and prestige. So we have an offering and it's brought to the temple. And it's you know typically a more inexpensive offering. There had there are, as we've seen, there are Instances where a rich person will bring an animal, which is a more substantial offering, and a poor person will only bring a meal offering. And that may seem to be a little bit, you know, smaller, you know, less valuable, less important, less prestigious. When it is eaten by the Kohen, the Kohen, the religious and spiritual leaders of the people, they eat it. And it's not given out to the poor people. It's not given out to the destitute, even to the needy. Only the Kohen. The Kohen! They're the ones who eat it. That elevates this entire offering. And perhaps this is the reason why it is required. It's mandatory. It's not just optional. The Kohen must consume the leftovers of the Mincha. And there are some differences. You know, there are many things that are given to the coin. And with respect to other items given to the coin, it's not just the coin themselves who's working in the temple. 
but even members of their household, their family, their their children, even their their servants, even their animals can eat teruma. This, this is a sacrifice. This part of it has been offered atop of the altar. Whatever is left over must be eaten by the Kohen themselves. Now, the way this is done, typically, is that when a mincha is brought, and again, there are many, many, many different types of mincha, different pans, different instances where someone would be either obligated or be allowed to offer a mincha offering. Some of them are voluntary. But there's a whole process for you know, processing the mincha. And three fingerfuls are elevated atop the altar, and the rest are for the Kohen. That is mitzvah number 134. 135 is the prohibition against making it into chametz. Of course, we know that in the temple there was almost never an instance where there was chametz. But this is referring to even after it becomes the property of the Kohen, someone brings a meal offering, and three fingerfuls are placed atop the altar, and the rest, so it's like a pretty hefty amount of flour, it's given to the Kohen, and he wants to eat it, but he likes cookies. So he wants to make them, make them into good cookies. So you would add some yeast and add some other... That's not allowed. There's a prohibition against taking these leftovers, the parts of the mincha not offered on the altar. It's a prohibition to make it into chametz. That's mitzvah number 135. 136 is the daily mincha offering of the Kohen Gadol. This is a, a type of mincha offering that we have not yet seen. This is called either a minchas chavitin or a minchas kohen mashiach. But this is a special offering that, a mincha offering that's done by the kohen, God, the high priest. There are many kohen and many priests, but only one high priest. And they must bring two mincha offerings every single day. And that's mitzvah, mitzvah number 136. And the Sefer Chinuch tells us that the uh, Kohen Gadol, the high priest, they're a very important person. They represent the nation. They are the messenger of the nation. They are the intermediary of the nation because they pray on behalf of the nation. Not to say that the nation cannot pray to God directly. Of course, everyone can. Even the wicked can pray to God directly. Nevertheless, there is an outsized role that the high priest, that the Kohen Gadol has, that through his prayer, the nation gets atonement. So he's a public figure. Of course, he's one person, but he represents the public. So he has like a status of, of the public. And we know that the public must bring two daily sacrifices. The morning Tamid offering and the afternoon Tamid offering. The first sacrifice done in the morning in the temple. Every single day, every single day is the Tamid offering. Tamid means continuous or all the time. And the final sacrifice brought every day is the afternoon Tamid offering. And that is brought by the whole nation. All other sacrifices happen in between those two bookends. The Kohen Gadol, he's like the public. And therefore he too should have two daily sacrifices, not animal sacrifices. But he brings two meal offerings and that's done in conjunction with the, the two daily sacrifices, the two daily Tamid offerings, and the themes behind all sacrifices tells us the Sefer Chinuch, is that it helps us develop and deepen and retain our relationship with God. 
A sacrifice is a tool, the Sefer Chinuch tells us, to awaken our thoughts. And we can live a whole life and forget about the Creator. And we bring sacrifices as a means to direct ourselves towards God and to try to kind of sacrifice the animal that we have within us that is inhibiting our connection with the Almighty. And we want the high priest to have this experience so he can pray on our behalf and he can have this awakening that will help deepen his connection with the Almighty. And therefore he has his own sacrifice and it's his. And there's only one person who brings this type of sacrifice. That's the high priest. This is his and only his. And when there's something that's yours, it has your name on it. This particular sacrifice is only done by the high priest. There is actually a very similar sacrifice known as the Minchas Chinuch, which is brought by an ordinary Kohen on the first day of their work in the temple. It's almost the same. It's not quite the same as the daily Mincha offering of the high priest. The particular offering of the high priest that he brings twice a day is done only by him. And when someone has their own sacrifice, this is theirs. When something something is yours, you pay much more careful attention to it. And that will help the high priest deepen his connection with the Almighty and do his job on our behalf uh, with, uh, with greater impact. Now he does tell us what the process is of this particular mincha, he brings an isaron, a flower. This is a certain measurement of flour. And he divides it in half. And he also brings three loads of oil. And he mixes the flour and the oil. And then he blanches it. He scalds it with hot water. And then he takes from each half Isaron, he kneads it into six loaves. So he has six with one half, six with the other half, making a total of 12 loaves. Does it one at a time. And then he bakes it a little bit. And then he fries it with a certain type of frying pan together with that oil. So if you're following, he scalds it, he bakes it, and then he fries it. And then he divides each one of these 12 loaves into half. So it's like 12, and now he has 24. 24 half loaves. And he offers half in the morning and half in the evening. And this, like all minchas that originate by a kohen, are burned entirely and not eaten by anyone. And that brings us to Mitzvah number 137, the prohibition against the consumption of a mincha offering of a Kohen. Every mincha offering brought by a Kohen, regardless if it's a regular Kohen, a Kohen Gadol high priest, or whatever type of mincha offering that a Kohen may bring, whether or not it's that mincha offering you bring on day one of your service, it's the daily high priest, mincha offering. An ordinary coin does a sin that demands a mincha. Or it's an optional mincha brought by a coin. Regardless, any mincha that originates by a coin is burned entirely. No one consumes it. And the reason, Sefer Chinuch tells us, he says that if, if a coin were to consume it, then instead of the of the sacrifice having such power to awaken our hearts and to, to, to rouse us from our slumber, it will be viewed as the baking of bread that you need to have for breakfast. And even if you were to say, you know what? A Kohen can eat it, but just not the Kohen who brings it. 
then what will you have? Every Kohen says, I'll bring a mincha offering and you'll eat it. And tomorrow you'll bring one and I'll eat it. After all, bread is fungible. And well, it'll all even out. In order to avoid that, to avoid losing the power of an offering, it's not to be eaten by all. Any Kohanic mincha is completely burned. So to recap, we have four mitzvos all relate to a mincha offering and how it relates to a Kohen. Number one, a Kohen must eat the mincha leftover, the mincha leftovers of an ordinary mincha, as long as it's not brought by a Kohen. With that, it can have a minute chametz. We have the high priest bringing a daily mincha offering. And finally, we have the prohibition not to consume from a Kohen's mincha offering. Now, a few months ago, I guess it's about a half a year ago, I spoke about one of these subjects in a Parsha podcast. I found it to be very interesting. The daily mincha offering brought by a high priest. The way it is described in the verses is that this is the mincha of Aaron and his sons. On the day of a Kohen's inauguration, the first time they do any work in the temple, they bring, it's a one-time deal, they bring a minchas chinuch, an inauguration mincha. And that same minchas chinuch, that same inauguration mincha with, with, one, with some slight, slight, slight differences, almost imperceptible differences, that is brought by the Kohen Gadol every single day. And it's actually, it's actually more than that because a high priest on the first day of their inauguration to be a high priest also brings a minchas chinuch, an inauguration mincha, not for their work in the temple, but for their work to the temple now as a high priest. Thus, there is a possibility for a Kohen to bring three identical mincha offerings, or almost identical mincha offerings, on one day. If there was a Kohen who on day one was nominated to be the high priest, they would bring a, a, a mincha offering at, to inaugurate their tenure as a Kohen. They'd bring a second inauguration mincha to inaugurate their tenure as a high priest, and they bring the daily mincha offering brought by a high priest twice a day. If a Kohen were to not bring this inauguration offering on day one, suppose you have a Kohen, a 30-year career, doing all sorts of work in the temple. They just happen to have forgotten to do the inauguration Mincha on day one of their tenure. All the work that they did in the temple is invalid. If a Kohen does not have on day one an inauguration Mincha, they cannot do work. They're not qualified to do any work at the temple until that has been done. It seems like this particular offering is what renders a Kohen into being qualified to do service in the temple. But on the Parsha podcast that I referenced earlier, I asked the following questions. Isn't it interesting that we have two Kohan and two priests on the opposite ends, so to speak, of the spectrum of prestige, you have the most veteran Kohen, the high priest, and the most junior Kohen, day one, first in the job. They both bring the same sacrifice. Why would a high priest bring the same sacrifice that an ordinary priest that an ordinary priest brings on day one? And the flip side, what business does an ordinary coin on day one, you haven't even been here for a day, to bring a sacrifice that's the same thing that a high priest brings? 
So on that aforementioned Parsha podcast, I suggested some, perhaps some lessons from both of these offerings. If you're going to be a high priest, you have to live every day as if it's your first day in the job. There can be no erosion in the excitement, in the energy, in the sense of novelty. You cannot walk around and say, oh, I've done this a million times before. You can't get into the mode of like, this is just business as usual. You can't behave out of habit, out of rote. Every day must have some element of this is day one. I think that what differentiates the giants, or one of the things that differentiates the giants from the common folk, is that the giants are able to maintain a degree of stamina, of spiritual stamina, over the course of a very, very long period of time. It's been speculated. If you look at the two greatest figures in the Torah, it's Abraham and Moshe. Both of them undergo a very long journey in service of God. Abraham is told, Lech Lecha, leave your hometown, the place where you were born, your family, and go to the land that I will show you. And that's the beginning of Abraham's journey. And the end of his journey, Abraham again is told, Lech Lecha, go for yourself. Go to Mount Moriah and offer Isaac as a sacrifice. Isn't it interesting that Abraham's journey begins and ends with the same words? Lech Lecha. And I think that that tells us that Abraham was on this mission, even though if you do the math, it's it's more than 60 years from when the first instruction was given until when the last instruction was given. But Abraham was on this journey and he maintained a certain uh, a certain status, a, cer- a certain perception a certain dedication, a certain commitment that was constant, that was constant throughout the duration of all those years. Similarly, Moshe, if you look at his storyline, it's also bookended, it's also bookended by two Descriptions of Moshe going on a journey. Vayelech Moshe, Moshe went. Vayelech Moshe, Moshe went. This is chapter 4 of Exodus, all the way to, I think it's chapter 31 of Devarim. Moshe's on this journey, he's going, and he's going 40 years with the same commitment and submission to the Almighty. The giants are able to maintain, they have the spiritual stamina to maintain the values and the motivation and the commitment and the devotion to the mission without it eroding over time. What made someone a high priest? It could be day 5,000 on the job, and it's like day one. They're still bringing the same sacrifice that the the, the, the green Kohen, First day in the job, with all that bright-eyed excitement, they still have that many, many years after they got started. And on the flip side, you have an ordinary coin, and who, who are you? You're a little schnook. You walk around, you see, you know, Aaron the high priest, and you, you know, your your eyes are open, you're agape, watching all these people, and and I'm so small, I'm so insignificant. You feel like, you know, maybe what, maybe I'm kind of redundant, maybe I don't have the uh, importance of someone else. Maybe my role is so insignificant, it doesn't really matter if I do a a good job or not. Who really cares 
the day when you're told. You may be the most junior of priests, but you are the high priest of your job. The role that you have to play, you are responsible for it. And to a certain extent, you may have a smaller role than the high priest, but of your role, it's it's on you. And you're the high priest of that role. And therefore, you have to act on day one. Well, you're, you, you're the most junior of all kohanim. You have to act with the recognition that your job matters. And it's it's important. And you have responsibility that's in some way similar to the high priest. Yes, the high priest has, has a greater responsibility. But you are also responsible for your job. And your job won't get done if you don't do a good job in it. You're the high priest of your little fiefdom, of your little world. So, you know, I'm thinking about these mitzvos. We have mitzvos that we have never witnessed. And we study them, and we read, of course, every year in the Torah, we read about them. But I think there are some valuable lessons. If we study more of the details of, of these laws, there are valuable lessons for us as well. A, to strive to have uh, a spiritual stamina worthy of a high priest. We may get very excited and we may be inspired and that may fizzle out. And again, what separates the greats from everyone else is not the excitement that they have at the be- at the beginning, but can you perpetuate that? Can you maintain that? Can you ensure that no matter what, after years, you're still inspired and you're still operating as if it's day one? On the flip side, if we have a small role, that has to be elevated, that has to be augmented in our eyes. We're all a high priest of something. We all have a mission to do. We all have a reason why the Almighty deems it necessary that we exist. And on that mission, there's only one high priest, and that's us. The most junior of the Kohanim. Right when you get started, he behaves like the high priest for a day. Yes, of course, there's the idea of, you know, when you start something, you're on top of the world. But whatever you start, whatever mission you are undertaking, and that you are the high priest, that truly matters. So we have, again, four mitzvahs that relate to the mincha and how they are associated with the kohanim. 134, the kohanim must eat. They must. They're obligated to eat from the mincha leftovers. They cannot make it into chametz, mitzvah number 135. Every single day, a kohen gadol high priest brings a, a special mincha chavitin, a special mincha offering the daily Mincha offering of the high priest, and 137, the prohibition to con- against consuming from a Kohen's Mincha offering. We haven't seen any of these mitzvos, and we hope to finally witness them sometime really, really soon. Of course, my email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. I am looking forward to your questions, your comments, and your feedback. Okay. Anyone wants to chime in here uh, on any of the subjects that we spoke about today, be it um, the mincha offerings, be it um, uh, the situation, of course, in in Israel. Uh, as a reminder, on Sunday, we're going back to the regular Sunday schedule. Um, so hopefully that message to be sent out to everyone. Uh, we had our four weeks that we met on Tuesday nights. We're now back to uh, Sunday um, for, I guess, we have the uh, Torch calendar. The Torch calendar was printed, but for some reason it wasn't shipped out yet, so you'll still get yours. But um, I don't have one over here with me, but I was looking at the calendar. I I, I feel like we have a long time now. You know what? I'm going to go find one. I'm going to go find one for y'all. Let's find one for y'all. Yeah, one on my desk. Mm. We have a whole bunch of them here at the Torch Center. 
There we go. So there was some sort of snafu and they weren't mailed out. So usually we try to get them out before Shoshana. So we're like a month behind. It's kind of embarrassing, but I have exactly zero to do with this. I'm not embarrassed about it. So don't blame me. Um, but if you look at the calendar here, you know, we have October, nothing going on on Sundays. Hanukkah, we still meet on Hanukkah. Um, even the uh, even the secular holidays don't fall on Sunday. Today we got uh, we got two Adars. So all the way till April. April 21st is the only Sunday that I can see that we, we cannot meet because it's the day before for Pesach. So we got a lot of time, please God, uh, to meet every Sunday. Okay, anyone has any questions or comments uh, before we sign off over here? Tell us about your book. <laughs> I did a lot of work today on it. It was great. What do you want to know? Our our mission. It sounds exciting. Oh yeah, it's 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 really well. I last week I recorded the Parsha podcast with y'all, but then I was not happy with it. I thought it was a little too cumbersome and clunky. So actually, uh, I chatted with um, uh, with uh, with David David from Alabama. I asked him if uh, he thought it was he said it was good. I said, you know what? I got home. I spoke to my wife. I said, maybe I'll just re-record it. Because I, I thought it was a little bit too much because it was Shimon and Levi. I thought it was very complicated. Um, so I spoke about just about, uh, so I said, you know, I'll re-record it. But also, I'll also tell the audience about the about my book project that I've been talking with you all know, about. Last couple of uh, uh, months, it came up a few times. Uh, yeah, it's a very exciting project. Um, I have some notes here I'm working on. Just don't you think I'm sitting around here, uh, you know, all sorts of notes, but uh, this is this this is not like the amount of work that I have. Like I didn't mention on the podcast, but I have, you know, um, I said I have a whole over a hundred chapters outlined, which is uh, it's 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 monumental in scope and in size. Um, but the amount of pages of notes that I have written down in my outline, it might be two thousand pages. It might be. Probably not. Maybe maybe a thousand uh, for sure. A thousand pages for sure. Maybe fifteen hundred pages. So I'm very 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 excited. Uh, it's obviously a ton of work. I just I'm in the middle of writing now the introduction, which last time I wrote the introduction last. Um. But uh, this time I'm writing the introduction now. Um. Obviously I'll still rewrite it ten times probably before it's uh, done. But. What can I say? It's just um, it's a fun, fun project. Uh, it is something which is I, I think will be very beneficial for people. Um, it's definitely beneficial for me, which is always the barometer that I use. Uh, it's um, what can I say? I'm very excited to uh, work on it now. Now, now that I also threw it out in the public, now now there's like a there's pressure, you know. There's pressure for me to deliver, so I guess that's that's helpful. That's a good kind of pressure, beneficial, the productive uh, pressure. So I'm I'm looking forward to. I'll give you guys updates periodically on 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 how that's unfolding. Um, but it's good. It's good. We made a lot of progress today. Let's see. I just uh, my introduction. I did not have an outline for, so I'm just writing it out without an outline. Um. So I'm trying to write, you know, thousands of words a day, which is a lot if you know anything about, uh, you know, writing. Uh, today, let's see, today I wrote only 750 words. You know, but it's, it was hard words, you know, it was hard words. And we're not, things aren't over yet. <laughs> So, and also on a day that I have a class, and especially a day like today, which has been so crazy, past couple of days, it's been so difficult to work. Um, 
you know, it's harder. And tomorrow I have to record the new episode of the Parsha podcast. This is a new series. It's a new, it's a, it's a new series, a new year. It's Parsha Inspiratious. And I, I'm going to talk also about, about the about the war and what we, we need to do and all that. Um, so I'm looking forward, please, God, to hopefully a very, very productive um, winter, fall and winter. And thank you for reaching out and asking me about that, uh, Barb. I appreciate that. And and please feel comfortable to reach out about it. I'll give you, I'll give you updates. Okay, anyone else wants to say something before we sign off? No, thank you very much for coming tonight and teaching us. Of course. I'm, I'm glad that we didn't miss four weeks. So it wouldn't have been good to miss four weeks. I know it's a smaller crowd when we uh, when we moved to Tuesday night, but... And I still have to get back to Sandy about uh, whether it will make this uh, uh, more of a fixture every week. Maybe I'm I'm leaning towards yes, but I have, I have to kind of. I also accepted on I accepted like a new role as well. I don't know if I told you all about this. I'm teaching at one of the schools uh, twice a week. Did I tell you all about this? I did. I see one nod and one nod yes, one nod no. So I don't know. <laughs> so um regardless, I'm teaching some tomorrow morning I'm teaching at 825. So I gotta prepare for that as well. So um so thank God it's a full schedule, but uh we'll be in touch uh going forward about that. So you know how relentless Mary Lou is about your books? Yeah, it's the best. How relentless I will be about your Tuesday night. Okay, good. <laughs> good, good, good. Okay, so I'll see everyone on on Sunday, please, God. And um, and uh, everyone have a great uh, great couple of days. I'll see everyone on, on Sunday. Thank and thank you all for coming uh, all these Tuesday nights. It's It was fun. It was fun and enjoyable. Okay, take care, everyone.